to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Andy, Mike, and Jason, back with you. Tuesday episode of the Fantasy Footballers. Papa Josh has been banished from the office. We got him. And we got a lot of work done now because people aren't talking as much. See that big blank spot in the middle of Deucer's Alley? That looks good. That looks really nice. Yeah, he's, he's out of here. That was a good run for him. I mean, it's not a bad gig. He works like 20 hours a week. <laughs> And um, you and it's know, paid for forty. So it's right, like, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty good situation. Sweet gig. But no, we're back. Um, and yes, he will be back. Yeah, look, uh, because you know some people. Yes, I think, know. So look, he, he's on vacation. <sighs> he's not fired. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, we had a week off. Each of us uh, got some family vacations in, and. We're back. We had pre-recorded episodes last week. We got news we've got to cover, things that happened while we were away. So I'm excited to talk about that. We're talking early breakouts and sleepers. So like the Ultimate Draft Kit, it's out now, ultimatedraftkit.com. We have our consensus, breakout, sleepers, bus, values, all the rankings. I updated pretty significantly a couple days ago. Tons of names. Um, but these, today's show is about kind of uh, calling our shot on a few individual uh, a breakout and a sleeper pick for us individually, not necessarily guys that everybody here agrees with and making the case. Right, right. Yeah, in the UDK, we're trying to show the ones that are kind of consensus ballers beliefs. Uh, we'll we'll highlight if, you know, one person disagrees, uh, you know, read the blurbs. Uh, but yeah, here's just guys we we really like. The draft analyzer, which is part of the Ultimate Draft Kit, launches on July 1st, which is just a week away. And that will allow you to import teams, existing teams, uh, new teams you draft in August or into this month. And you can get a grade. We'll grade all of your position groups. We'll make suggestions to you about where you're weak, where you're strong, improvements you can make. And that is a really valuable tool all the way up until the season kicks off. There's also some pretty cool, uh, valuable age tools for that for dynasty leagues. Like when, when I use it, I can put in one of my dynasty teams that I already have and get a grade but also look at kind of the the overall the overall landscape of the team as a whole it's pretty valuable Andy put his team in and it just his phone turned to dust due to the age yes oh speaking of which news and notes from around the league you gave him too nice of a segue there Mike <sighs> it's fine let's go ahead and talk about this let me see here let me go through the dynasty roster McCaffrey, he's got a contract. I got him one of those. Uh, Mike Evans signed a deal. Kelsey, new extension. Mostert extension. Who else do I need to? Okay, Patriots running back Ramondre Stevenson has signed a four-year, $36 million contract extension. 26 years old, $17 million guaranteed, and yes, he's on my dynasty roster. The like the 36 is whatever. It's the 17. Is 17 million giving to a 26-year-old. It's an interesting decision to make as a football team. But for this year, uh, I said it, it whenever on one of our previous shows of I've been making trying to make a small case of like leaving margin. What if Ramondre falls out of favor with the team and Antonio Gibson is here and he comes in? Uh, then they gave him $17 million guaranteed. So that, that uh, that's gone. And you have to – I mean, you have to have faith that Ramondre will be – uh, in a a focal point of the offense. No more, not just talking about it, coach speak. They went out and they did something about it. Yeah, it's nice when both go the same direction, right? Right. Like the coaching staff has been talking about how important Ramondre Stevenson is to this offense, what a key cog it is. And then the, and then the organization said, yeah, this it's, it's not just words. This is an important piece to our offense. So for fantasy football, uh, for dynasty leagues, this is great. But even even redraft leagues, I think this should move the needle on Ramondre a little bit, give oh, you more yeah. confidence that this season he's going to be really the centerpiece of this offense because you look at the wide receiving core with either Jacoby Brissett or a rookie, and you're not sure how that's going to go. 
So Ramondre is the only like known piece of the Patriots that I'm like, okay, I'm I'm fine having Ramondre on my team. He's going to be the seventh highest per year running back with this contract. Uh, tons of question marks about how the offense will perform, but that is also an opportunity if you believe in the money spent and the fact that he produced a top 12 season before an injury plagued uh, mess last year. It's an opportunity to buy low. When an offense is literally, Mike, you brought up the fact that Vegas and, and the Sharps over there, they view it as the highest probability of being the worst team. So it's an opportunity to buy low if you believe in Ramondre, in Ramondre's talent. A lot's been made of the system changing to the more zone blocking scheme it you know and whether he's comfortable with it he did run that at Oklahoma that was one of the things that he was and, and if you go you can watch uh, Ian Harditz has a pretty good tweet showing every uh zone blocking play from the past year watching Ramondre in the system and whether or not you believe he's uh, capable of getting it done it's a lot of money and uh you know I just do what I can for my guys I get them paid a couple more guys on my on my starting roster I need to take care of just two Amari Cooper, I had him hold out a couple days at the end of camp. I'm working on that. I assume, Jason, you yeah, think that money's gonna... Yeah, that money's coming for yeah. sure. Yeah, and uh, Alvin Kamara, a little harder. I'm trying. Right now I'm having him sit out as well, and I'm trying him to leverage his past for his future is what I'm trying to your do. Your team is so ancient, and all of your starters got contract extensions. It's really uh, it's great management. It's so funny. It's so funny. If, I mean, I got Lockett on my bench. I got him a deal, too. I'm not even going to use him. If Kamara actually gets oh man because he should not oh no 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 (laughs) at least not new money the problem is is the momentum of my dynasty team once a few guys get deals the other guys want deals and i just have to work on a lot of jealousy out there for sure oh that was it was i was so happy to see that ramondre deal though because i just traded for him and for those of you out there that had i had seen like we had had the conversation on the show before the deal happened yeah so there were people that did go out there and throw deals out there to pick up Ramondre and, and ended up um, feeling a little bit better about the deal. doesn't mean he's going to be great. just means they're going to give hey, him a chance to be great. Perceptually, his his value is up. Uh, Aiden O'Connell right now, according to Jeremy Fowler, has a slight edge on Minshew. That's going to be a quarterback battle. I don't know what I want there. I'm going to be honest with you. Because Aiden O'Connell is like the devil you know in that offense. I feel like he's the one you don't know. Gardner Minshew, we've we've seen him start enough where you can go, okay, uh, you know, w- Michael Pittman last year was okay with Gardner Minshew. Devontae Adams is going to be okay. Aiden O'Connell, I think there's at least hope that he's got upside. Like, from the franchise, not from me. I don't – I think he is, uh, you know, who he is. He's a, a third-round uh, journeyman, ho- hopeful journeyman NFL quarterback. But at least there's – you know, you you don't know what his ceiling is yet because he, you know, he's what started ten games, and so Gardner is like a little bit safer, but the ceiling is irrelevant. It's the Devils. It's the Devils, the Devils you, you know. would like to not know, <laughs> Over probably the, for the, a Devonte Adams and Jacoby Myers, and I think for the team, it's probably like it, it's better to have Gardner there, but for as in like one year, but for the franchise, you're. You're hoping that Aiden O'Connell, you're, you're like you're crossing your fingers. Maybe he turns into our guy. If I had Adams, and this is going to be probably opposite of what you would want, but I would want O'Connell because I believe that Adams is a very opinionated, loud alpha, and I think that that controls. You're saying he's going to have Aiden O'Connell under his thumb. I that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and, and the fact that he'll throw it deep and he'll chuck it. And, you know, Minshew's going to be able to manage the game better. It'll be better for the Raiders probably and better for Zamir White. That's just my early thought. But we'll we'll see who wins it. Um, we did get news that Trevor Lawrence signed a five-year, $275 million contract while we were away. Um, got paid before Dak. I mean. Got can, paid a lot, $200 million grab, guaranteed. Well, yeah, he's, he's matching Joe Burrow's league-leading contract in total value and average annual salary. Um, you're going to have to do this. You can't let Trevor Lawrence walk. He's the face of your franchise, the former number one overall pick. He is not worth this money. He is not worth this kind of dough. I mean, he's just – this is this is like best quarterback in the league money. Lawrence has fewer total touchdown passes than Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers in the last three years. <laughs> Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers did not play this last year. There have been flashes. 
This was the quarterback eight in 2022. Last year, he did deal with not just having injuries that caused him to finally miss a game, but playing through them for a, a, a stretch. He had a three-game stretch where he was number one, six, and five in three consecutive games. There is – I'm trying to, you know – There's certainly hope that he becomes a superstar. And and there and there have been flashes, but you don't usually pay on hope. You're back. You're backed into this because you either have to start over or you have to commit to your Jay Cutler. And right now they're committing to their Cutler. And I think I would have just forced him to play out, franchised him a couple times, seen what I got. Would have had to pay him a lot more. The way these things. Have you see that rumor about them having a separate? Oh uh, uh, yeah, a separate quarterback salary cap. Salary cap for quarterbacks yeah. only. It, the, the this is why Dallas is messing up again is because, you know, this is a team that hasn't made it out of the divisional round since 1995, which is mind-blowing. And they played this Dak game once before and then paid them way more than they would have had to. And now they're doing it again. What are you going to do when they go out and they win 12 games this year, 13 games? They're gonna, they will win at least 10. And then what are you going to do, not pay them? It it feels like they Trey want, Lance season. It feels like they want to not pay him. It, By the it, way, that's the one that hurt the most that we forgot the other day which? in the AMA that we should have brought up. Uh -oh. What player from the past is the most haunting? I shouldn't have said Gibson. It would have been Lance. Yeah, Trey Lance. That's that's a rough one. I, the way they talk about him, sometimes I think they they want him to be their starter next year. I don't know if this is just in contract negotiations with Dak, but um, yeah, they, I mean they they wait too long to pay people. They're gonna do it with CD. With Dak. Yeah, CD's not been paid either. Uh, Zach John, uh, Jackson writes, it's his belief the Browns will open the season with Jerry Judy in the slot. Amari Cooper and Cedric Tillman out wide. We're mentioning this with the Browns in part because Cedric Tillman has been getting a lot of buzz. He has. Um, and the fact that he'll have a starting job, or so it seems, very interesting for deeper leagues. Pay attention to that. I think he's a good player. We, we yeah. all kind of felt like he didn't get an opportunity last year. They had four quarterbacks. But Jerry Judy in the slot, thank goodness. I mean, Elijah Moore. Yeah, I mean, that how, dude. That that might be the worst player in the history of the I dislike Elijah. Thank you. Like he thank might, you. He might be the worst and that's NFL putting wide it receiver in the history of football. Why, why are we so angry at Elijah I'm not, Moore? I'm not saying that there aren't players who are, are, are worse than him as a wide receiver. There are. They don't get on the field. But as far as people that are on the field, getting the ball thrown their way. 104 targets. I mean, he has done the least with the most opportunity I can remember. 104 targets, okay, with 59 receptions despite a yards per catch of 10, which means you caught 57% of the balls thrown your way that were close to you. That were real easy catches. And nobody, I mean, he already got walked out of New York. Yeah, something, something weird happened. Something doesn't work, man. Yeah. And so they're looking for less of him and more of Jerry Judy. Um, all right. I think that is it by way of news, unless you guys have anything else you want to bring up. Nope. All right. You guys want to get into these breakouts? Yes, sir. Breakouts. Let's talk for a, a moment about how we look at this category. Uh, we define a breakout when we talk about them in the UDK and we and we list them out there as a fantasy player that's primed to become that fantasy darling that everybody falls in love with, a, a future fantasy superstar, game changer. Um, maybe they've flashed, giving you small windows of success, but not a full season. Uh, but we think maybe with another year under their belt or a changing situation, changing quarterback, whatever the case may be, this could be the year that they enter a different tier, right? We break the uh, the UDK up in tiers. Yeah, yeah. This is this is where you're going to tier jump one or two or however many spots it takes to get up in those first two rounds the following season. And or if you don't get up into those first two rounds the next season, you still made an impact that won championships this year. Like these are guys that we see a pathway towards superstardom fantasy championships. So, do you guys want me to start, or do you guys want to go first? You, I don't care. You go ahead. No, no, it's not Will Levis. But it, not exactly Will Levis. It's it's dependent on Will Levis. For me, it's 
right now, and it could change, last summer was the summer of Mike Evans for me, where I had the strongest conviction about Mike Evans, his price in drafts that made him a my guy that I thought was guaranteed. And right now, the closest contender to that category for me right this minute is Calvin Ridley, um, who's connected to Will Levis, who I think is the future Jameis Winston of our dreams. Because <laughs> Jameis Winston has never been the world's greatest quarterback. But for fantasy, he's on the Mount Rushmore of Chuckers because Will Levis loves to throw the ball deep. Um, Calvin Ridley, that's the kind of targets that you like. And this is the reason why. This is not a discussion. This is not a breakout to me if Calvin Ridley is sitting anywhere relative to the top 36 or the top 24. He's being drafted as the wide receiver 40 in the seventh round. I've taken him in every mock draft we've ever done. And I don't think Calvin Ridley, because of the age, because of the Will Levis and Tennessee factor, I don't think he's moving in drafts. I don't think I can. I could have a whole show on Calvin Ridley. I don't know if he's moving. I don't know if you need preseason highlights or whatever the case may be. But I believe that Calvin Ridley, with Will Levis, with what they're handing over, offensive-wise, no Derrick Henry, I think Calvin Ridley's guaranteed to outperform his ADP. I really do. He was tied for the fifth most 20-plus yard targets among all wide receivers last year. Uh, Will Levis loves to throw the deep ball. Um, against zone coverage, 23% of all his attempts were 20-plus yards down the field. That was number one in the NFL. It's going to be a shotgun offense with a couple of small running backs. He's going to have it, you know, he's going to run through the air with those little running backs. It's going to be in his hand all the time. Uh, Brian Callahan's coming over. They're going to have a high pass rate. And I think Calvin, I mean, Calvin really got paid big time money. Yeah, that's the only reason he's there. And to me, you know, he went out and he made an impression specifically on Tennessee when he played against them last year because he, he cooked <laughs> them for seven for 103 and two and then six for 106 and one. So they seem to really, really like him. But last year, Calvin Ridley, like, what would you say the vibe was when the season ended? What was last season for Calvin Ridley? Disappointing. Yeah, super disappointing. Because of the the variability. Yeah, right? the inconsistency. He was, yeah, very hot, cold. He, and Do you know where also he finished? Also because he started, you know, week one is such a dominant player that yeah. people started him for a long time. We're very disappointed. I I don't know where he finished. I yeah, would imagine I, it's probably around wide receiver 15. He's 17. Okay. And he was drafted at 18 last year. Now he's being drafted at 40, which I think is just wild. I mean, this offense to me, Will Levis is going to have the opportunity. So I have him the highest of the three of us. Um, I think it's a perfect mix. A deep ball thrower with somebody that um, I think was really good on the field last year, but at times didn't have the rapport with Lawrence or Lawrence was missing him. We talked about all the misses in the end zone for Calvin Ridley. He had some drops, but they paid him a huge amount of money. He had the most end zone targets. He was tied for CeeDee Lamb last year. This is going to be a go-to receiver. If you come here and you say, well, no, no, DeAndre Hopkins is going to – DeAndre Hopkins is, is sunsetting. Like, I think he's still a decent player, but Calvin Ridley's the bona fide one to me. Um, he had six top ten performances. It just was not consistent last year, but I, I really believe in him. I, I, I don't know if I stand alone here in the group. I really he's, don't, but I love him this year. I don't love him. I mean, being drafted right now, let's see, best ball, wide receiver 35 on sleeper, wide receiver 40. I think he outproduces that. Uh, the watching the videos of the near misses with him in Jacksonville, it's it's interesting of like who who is actually in the wrong. Uh, trying to figure that out, it can be very difficult. So they I, had some I, of that Derek Carr, Chris Olave problem last right. year. Yeah, yeah, but the the ADP is interesting to me. But I I like I the Hopkins is also like. He's going around Calvin Ridley. You know, like these are guys who are are pretty much afterthoughts. And I wonder if when I'm really drafting is do I bypass Calvin Ridley because I know I can get the uh, Hopkins cheaper uh, by at least a little bit. Kyle, do we have – can you pull up his numbers for me real quick? Uh, so that, that would be my only argument against Calvin Ridley is that maybe I can get DeAndre Hopkins – get something relatively close in terms of fantasy points output because I mean it, Ridley Ridley was on the field a lot a lot so, to get like all those all the the numbers when you're like well the end of season he had the the most this the most that 
those are it's correct but he was also like on the field m almost more than anybody in the NFL at the wide receiver position so that's that's a question what does that look like in Tennessee is he running just that far ahead they're basically back to back in ADP okay well then if they're if they're right back to back then I don't know probably I'm gonna I'm gonna diversify a little bit I'll take some Ridley some Hopkins yeah I I was pretty strongly out on Ridley um early in the offseason when he signed going to Tennessee seemingly for money being older having a disappointing season but I I I have I've I've changed my tune quite a bit and a lot because of you Andy your confidence in him as the clear one here because when I statted these guys out originally it was really like Hopkins is just as good and you know that there could be you know a hard path to getting a target market share from Will Levis to be a superstar but also where they're going right now in drafts you're not risking much and I, I there is the upside there so if you're if you're taking you know what did you say he was what like wide receiver 40 or something yeah I'm actually curious what other names are going out around there I'm gonna I'm gonna look at that yeah he's going at 40 right now um so let me see I guess it kind of depends where you're at but like Hollywood I would rather have 40 is Ridley. Uh, Odunze, Ridley. Addison, Ridley, Deontay Johnson, uh, Xavier Worthy, Terry McLaurin. I think These are the a, names. I think that he's are in a good name to. I think he's a good name to point out there. I, I, I certainly there's a reason he's going that late. The path is murky, and it doesn't feel like a home run that he's going to do it. But he can do it, and for where he's going, I think the path is better for him than some of those other guys so Ridley's my pick we're going to take a quick break and come back with Jason's breakout selection and I am looking forward to it because I I might be with him your pick uh where you were with Ridley and I want to hear your argument for him And that was Jason's argument for him, so uh, not convinced. Sorry. Yeah, so my breakout uh -huh. player uh, for 2024 is none other than Isaiah Pacheco. There we go. Uh, starting workhorse running back for the Kansas City Chiefs. This swing is, like, that swing noise at the end, is it really is. It diminishes. The, yeah, it yeah. takes away from what this man has done. It's a non-serious sound. Yeah. Like, we're talking about serious. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a touchdown. A serious that, running back here that sounds like a cartoon character. Yeah, but, uh, you know, he is, I think, a really good back. We liked him going into 2023. The problem was he had a seventh-round NFL draft capital. Like, he, he, this was not a team that had invested a lot in him. He, they, he wasn't super proven, and so you weren't sure what you were going to get. And he had a solid season. Um, you know, he, he finished – in half PPR, I think, as the running back 16, somewhere right around there, yes. and, he, and he missed uh, three games. So he had a solid season. But what this team has done is really show that Isaiah Pacheco is their main guy. Through the playoffs last year, they relied on him and their running game with this great defense to win a Super Bowl. He had a touchdown in three of the four playoff weeks, and his involvement in the passing game has been critical. What did they do in this offseason? They did nothing to address the running back position whatsoever. I mean, you're still – they re-signed Clyde edwards -Alaire. They addressed it. But, you know, Keontae Ingram is maybe the backup behind there. Like, the, it is his team now in, the, in the, the running back room is Isaiah Pacheco's. And what I love is if you dive a little deeper on last year, keeping in mind when you came into the season, we weren't sure. Jarek McKinnon – uh, Clyde Edwards Alaire, how involved will they be? Is this just a three way timeshare? And to start the season, it was. Uh, Isaiah Pacheco. Yeah, McKinnon was always a problem because of his versatility in the passing absolutely. game. Absolutely. And, and, and you saw that the first three weeks. McKinnon and CEH combined for more than 50% of the snaps. Uh, you had 46% of the snaps going to Isaiah Pacheco. But then from week four on, they flipped it. Instead of 46%, it was 64% of the snaps for Isaiah Pacheco. And during that time, he was a rock-solid fantasy asset. How good was he? 14.7 fantasy points per game. And that's the majority of the season. That's not like this tiny little stretch. That's just getting the first three weeks out when we weren't sure how they were going to utilize him, and it seems they weren't sure how they were going to utilize him. 14.7 fantasy points per game and half PPR scoring would put him right between two players. Brees Hall last year had 14.9. And Jameer Gibbs had 14.4. You look at the touchdown variance last year for the Kansas City Chiefs. 
they have been scoring so many more points over the previous four seasons than they scored this last year, but the opportunities are still there for him. He gets work inside the red zone. He gets work inside the 10 zone and inside the five zone. And he did, he did well with that. He only, he got 10 carries um, inside the 10 yard line and he converted the, five of those into touchdowns. So, you know, he's capable. And so what could a breakout look like for year three? Well, we all have him projected for more than 280 plus total touches. I've got him right at 300. You two both have him at 289 total touches. And so, yeah, Mike and I talked. We decided 289 <laughs> was the right yeah. number. It just sounded too good. 289 is my favorite number. Um, here's a list of year three running backs with 280 plus touches over the last decade. You got Alfred Morris finished as a top 15 running back. Devonta Freeman, number six. Todd Gurley finished number one. Melvin Gordon finished five. Zeke finished five. Christian McCaffrey, number one. Aaron Jones, number two. Dalvin Cook, number five. Leonard Fournette, number nine. Chris Carson, running back 10. Joe Mixon, running back 13. And Najee was running back 21. So the majority of the time, when you get a year three back who Freaking the team Najee. <laughs> gives him a large workload, you're talking about at least a top 15, if not a, a high-end Top 10 guy. So, two questions for you. One is, you know, I think this is one of those, it happens every year, there's a handful of guys. Are you willing to trust them to take the step, right? Like, that's a Pacheco situation here is it's like, he's not a perennial, always been there guy. He's a taking the step guy. So, it's hard to trust. But the other question I have for you is just related to your, you ended up with Patrick Mahomes at number one mm -hmm. overall in your rankings. So, you're obviously very bullish on a bounce back passing game there. I guess I wonder how that factors into the entire equation, like, Obviously, all you know, chips can rise in an offense, but you know, is it is it Pacheco's involvement in the passing game that you think will will be steady? Yeah. So if you look at those those last eleven games that he played after the first three weeks, he was very involved in the passing game. He was on pace for fifty seven receptions. Um, that is a great number to add to a guy who could be a double digit touchdown scorer in one of the best offenses in the league. So when I've got Patrick Mahomes number one, it's because I see the Kansas City Chiefs offense being much better this year than it was last year in total touchdown scoring. And that's going to go – some of those will go to Pacheco. That'll be down near the red zone, and he'll get more work there. Uh, but he's also involved in the pass game. Jarek McKinnon is gone. Clyde Edwards-Alaire is dead. So it's like no. – um, Oh, no. He, he really doesn't oh, no. have – Metaphorically. Metaphorically. Not actually dead. He's, Just, a, he's alive. Yeah, you know, but, you, but you know. Yeah. You know, it's like you know what I'm saying. Um, so what, I, I what think Pacheco's the dude for a great offense. I mean, he's only making like three million a year. Do you need me to get on the phone? Yeah, if I could, if I had him, I'd trade him to your roster just to make sure. Yeah. I don't think yeah. he's a contract. Yet. But w what happens to you, Jay, if July rolls around and Jarek McKinnon's back on this team? Uh, Jarek McKinnon was on the team last year. It didn't make a difference for him once he took over the role. He was very good. And where you're drafting him right now is at his floor. Where you're drafting him is basically. Where's he going? Uh, RB12? Yeah, RB12, I think that's about near his floor. Maybe he'll fall to RB15, but like it's you're not you're not risking McKinnon the top missed, two pick. McKinnon did miss four of the last seven games of the year. I don't know if it matters. I don't know how much those overlap with the same games that uh, Pacheco missed because Pacheco actually missed several at the end. I think three of the 14 and 15, he yeah. missed those. Okay, those are the two weeks that uh, McKinnon was back and did some stuff, so that's interesting. Uh, definitely not as integral last year, McKinnon, as he was the season before. So, um, Pacheco having a floor of twelve though feels pretty, pretty spicy. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I put his floor at fifteen. Uh, he's being drafted at Can twelve. I get so sixteen? No, no way. His okay. floor is fifteen. All right. Well, so the, now you the heard floor it here. is the floor. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike actually got a name in so quick that I was <laughs> furious with him. Um, so but it just means you're in agreement here. I am in agreement, so I'll shut up. It's George Pickens of the Pittsburgh Steelers who is going as the wide receiver 29 right now on sleeper. That's the like the second half of the fifth, 28th over on underdog in best ball. And the Pittsburgh Steelers have thus far, they're making a bet on George Pickens. Because he, look, he's their guy. They they shipped Deontay Johnson out of town. Right now, the lineup is uh, George Pickens. Then you have Van Jefferson uh, slotted as a starter, and then rookie Roman Wilson projects to be the starting slot wide receiver. But it's George Pickens is really 
the only proven player. You have Calvin and Austin still. Is he he is. Yeah, he's yeah he's hanging still, around. Yeah, so that's another part. There's a there's a lot of guys on like Scotty Miller's there. Quez Watkins is there. <laughs> there's a whole bunch of guys. But and then there's George Pickens. It's just yeah, George Pickens is the one who we know who can actually like ball out and make highlight real catches. Yes, he absolutely vanishes. A guy who put up 1140 yards and five receiving touchdowns somehow has a consistency score of D on, oh, man. on our website. He had Be 63 catches to get the 1,140 yards. That's crazy. Because during this season, you had the blockbuster event of Week 9 versus Tennessee where he had two receptions for negative one yard. And then you have Week 16 against the Cincinnati Bengals where he's four for 195 and two. Uh, it, look, it was very inconsistent last year, but the point is the Steelers are in on him. And when we saw him without Deontay Johnson last year, it's only four games, but he jumped from, uh, you know, he jumped from 8.6 half PPR points all the way over 14, from five targets to over eight, from 52 yards to 89 yards. I think that he is ready to make that jump. We can make all the jokes about Russell Wilson we want to, but Russell Wilson is still better than Kenny Pickett. I, I don't know about that. I, Unlimited diarrhea. <laughs> I I can confidently say Russell Wilson is a better quarterback than Kenny Pickett. Like I'm locking that in. And you know what? Better than Mason Rudolph, which we had a, a pretty strong run there at the end for the Steelers uh, when Pickens was actually putting up numbers. But historically speaking, year two is where we see these wide receivers break out. Like the, the If someone's going to break out into the top 24 – the high percentage chances is coming in year two, and then year three and on. Year three is where you see like the first true ceiling of that player's career, and I, I get that it was inconsistent, but eleven hundred and forty yards and five touchdowns on a really really bad passing offense, I like that's a break. I'm so in on George. That's Pickens. a breakout campaign to me. I've had such a hard, difficult time believing in George Pickens. I mean, we. I, Russell Wilson, and and uh, yeah, I mean, I I love the splits where when you didn't have Deontay Johnson, yeah, it, it, he he was able to show it. But I do, I am a big believer in Roman Wilson, so I don't think they just you know when they lost Deontay Johnson, they lost him and they didn't get to just add someone. But now in the off season, they've brought in Roman Wilson, who I think is going to be the main slot guy. I'm a little bit scared, but when I look at these numbers, it's like exactly what you just said: 1,140 yards as a sophomore. That's great for a bad yeah. team. And now he's going into a third year where you do get rid of the the primary, uh, you know, target leader last year. So I will say this: I just did an underdog draft. I I I went. Uh, I I started with Jamar Chase, so then I went RB RB. I needed my wide receiver two, and I was staring down two names as my wide receiver two. It was, and I know where Andy will be. So this question is for you, Mike. Okay. It was George Pickens or Christian Kirk. Ooh. And I I made my as decision. As your wide receiver, too? Yes. I mean, if, if you're playing to win, the pick is George Pickens. Oh, I was not. <laughs> you were playing to lose? I was, well, I mean, like, I was playing for second, Mike. I'm playing, like, if I'm playing to win the underdog tournaments. No, I'm, this it, is, wasn't no a full, it wasn't listen, a full tournament. Oh, okay. Knowing you, like, this is, I'm going to peel back the curtain. Jason, when he sees a menu, sometimes he wants a show more than he wants sustenance. 100%. Sometimes he wants a show more than he even wants taste. Correct. And... You're sitting here, and George Pickens is the best thing on the menu. They're going to bring it out. It'll probably have some smoke, some fire, uh, table side like preparation. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it, Christian Kirk is the it's the. Let's it, have some soda water. I love I mean, Christian Kirk, but yeah, it's, I'm trying to eat healthier though right now, okay. and I, I feel right. like if you're just talking about like a healthy meal, that's got to be Christian Kirk. Yes, yes, that is. Yeah, that's of course, true. of course. So you know, nutritionally speaking, but his Christian Kirk's a better wide receiver. Nutritionally speaking, sure, but nobody really enjoys that life. But if you're looking, are for you ceiling, enjoying your life a lot more now that you're eating healthy? <laughs> yeah, I am. Oh, okay. oh okay. yeah. Good, yeah good it's because you, you're man. coherent during the show. But right, yeah. One quick last thing. So over the last decade, thirteen wide receivers have hit a thousand yards before turning twenty-three. Then in year three. The 17 game pace of those wide receivers, about 13 points per game, which would uh, put you right around wide receiver 18. And uh, again, that's on average. Some were better, some were worse. 
but George Pickens is being drafted as almost the wide receiver 30. I think, silly. I, I think his 80 – uh, the way you feel about Calvin Ridley's yes. ADP, I feel like that about George Pickens. Maybe, maybe he doesn't get where we think, where we hope and dream he can get. But to be drafted at the bro, uh, wide bro. receiver thirty, we're Pickens pals. Okay? Yeah, 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 all right. We're going to the grave with. We're having the show at the side of the table. Uh, Jason can eat his like whatever his salad uh, that he uh, orders. Pickens basket. Man, no. Pickens Were you trying to do like a Yogi Bear <laughs> that thing? Was a pic picnic basket. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it didn't yeah. work. No? Okay. Yeah. All right. Keep keep trying. <laughs> a picking in basket. That's what I thought. Inspection. That's what I thought you were doing. Uh luckily I got this button and we can move on. Sleepers. Oh boy. Um I got a name for you. Deep sleeper. But Oh man, I hope I was really thinking he had a good nickname for George Pickens. I was excited. Uh, not better than that one. Um, I'm going to go with Jermaine Burton wide receiver for the Cincinnati Bengals this year undrafted. So I think that fits the sleeper category when you're not sure. being drafted third round draft pick, right? Tons of potential went to Georgia for a couple of years. Then he came out of Alabama. They were extremely excited to be able to land him in the third round. Do you know how many receptions T Higgins had last year for this roster? I bet you can't even guess <laughs> I, it. I, not only do I not know, I don't even know where to guess. I Like 70? Okay, that's a neat guess. Yeah, I was going to guess around 70. What if I told you it was 42? Oh, man. Yeah, no, that, caught, that, ex that explains things of caught, my team last year. He caught, <laughs> he caught 42 <laughs> passes for this offense. He's the one that's back. He was injured twice in 2021, once in 2022, three times last year, and they're shipping him out of town after the season is over. Franchise tag. Tyler Boyd, who is gone, who's abandoning targets, had 67 receptions last year. Tyler Boyd also ran the 14th most routes in the league. So the person that's leaving is actually the more important person in terms of snaps and opportunities last year for the Bengals, not T. Higgins, who has his place, but we know what T. Higgins is going to do. 994 yards, 60-something catches, bunch of good games that Mike forgot to play him on, and then bad games when Mike plays him. Yeah. So Jermaine Burton is this big play waiting to happen with a 20-yard A dot. Um, <laughs> just, just, guys, guys, his average depth of target last year was 20 yards. He is. That is re. Ridiculous. I don't think any of us think of Tyler Boyd as a deep threat. Do you think of him that way? No. No. How many times have you seen Tyler Boyd running wild and free with with Joe a Burrow finding him few, down the field? A few. Yeah. There's been a handful of these times you're going, what in the world just happened? I think they really, really wanted Burton. They knew that he was the future. They knew that Higgins was not going to get the contract that he wanted. And look, the last three seasons with Chase and Higgins out there, Boyd's averaged 91 targets. There is a void. A Boyd void, my friends. Mike knew it was coming, and he started yeah. laughing before I said it. <laughs> and, you know, I think Burton is a really talented player. Last year we had our, our Puka, and, you know, we've had Amon Ra the year before. Like, the, there's some – there's a handful of rookie wide receivers. Maybe it's Roman Wilson this year in Pittsburgh as well to dissuade our Pickens uh, adoration. But Burton is primed. He's set up. Great quarterback play. You want to check that box. Great play caller. You want an oppor a great opportunity to be a, a valuable player on this team and to shape the next era of wide receiver play in Cincinnati, which will be Chase and Burton. It's not going to be Chase and Higgins anymore. So, you know, you've got missed games from Chase on the other side of this equation too. It's not just been Higgins missing time. Chase misses time. One of those guys goes down at all. All of a sudden, Jermaine Burton is the number one free agent pickup of the week because if it's an extended window, right? Yeah. If you yes. tell me Hig Higgins is missing six weeks, we're all going to be fighting to get Jermaine Burton yes. mm -hmm. onto this, onto your roster. So I think he's a perfect sleeper category type of player um, for Cincinnati this year. And and Mike, I know you really liked him yes. from the scouting process. So I don't know if you guys have anything to add there. No, I, th I think he's a really good wide receiver, but landing in a perfect spot for dynasty purposes. He's very undervalued for where he should be. For redraft purposes, the same, but I do think it would it would – take a little bit more like injury ahead of him for this season. The hardest part about the Burton redraft equation is that you generally, if it's a last pick, 
you want to see a guy that you know is going to have an opportunity in week one or two. We don't know that for Burton, but it could definitely happen because you could come into the season, you make him your last pick in your draft, and he catches an 84-yard touchdown in week one, and people are talking about him on the waivers, and he's already on your team. So um, I'm going to go with Burton for my sleeper pick. We'll take a quick break and come back with a couple more sleepers. All right, Mr. Moore. What you got? My sleeper is rookie running back for the Green Bay Packers, Marshawn Lloyd. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had a wild card episode where we talked about uh, Josh Jacobs. A lot of the things that I said on there apply. Um, Josh Jacobs could have a wonderful season. This is a this is an offense you want to find the right pieces of. It's hard to know exactly who that is, but he could also have a bad season considering he's coming off of one where Josh Jacobs you know, was trending the wrong way efficiency-wise. Yards per carry, 56 out of 69. More force missed tackle rate, 51st out of 69, which used to be his calling card. Um, you know, his his 0 0.57 fantasy points per opportunity is the lowest of his entire career. And so that uh, that's obviously the starter here. Uh, but Marshawn Lloyd was drafted by this team, and the team is really, really excited. He was in the third round. He's the fourth running back overall taken, number 88. And if you... If you look at the running backs taken in that range on day two over the last couple of years, there are some really big hits, whether it's Kenyon Drake, David Montgomery, Devin Singletary, Tajay Spears, Devon Achan, uh, David Johnson, Kareem Hunt, Rashad White. Like This is a place in the NFL draft where quality backs are going. Daniel Jeremiah's number one running back going into the draft was, was Marshawn Lloyd. This is not like just... This isn't one of those backs where it's like, oh, you know, Vidal Sassoon, we love. Maybe there's an opportunity. I There's no way I'm going to know his real name anymore. Dude. I mean, and you don't Kama, need is it to. Kamani? Yes. You Kamani don't, Vidal. You just, Sassoon. Just delete Kamani. Just, just delete Vidal. It's just Sassoon. It's um, just Sassoon. But, you know, it's not some day three uh, pick that's like, you know, we're always hopeful. Any injury can pr propel any rookie running back up ahead of him. But Marshawn Lloyd is a really good running back who landed on a really good offense. And this is an offense that uses a split committee, so even without an injury ahead of him, he's going to get opportunities. And he is the explosive athlete on this team. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can take the word of the Packers because they're saying stuff like this. Here's uh, Adam Stenovich talking about him. He said, I would like to get him out there as much as possible. He's got a skill set that's a little bit different than AJ as far as his speed. <laughs> yeah, you think? <laughs> Wait, look, than look. AJ Dillon? Yes. Uh, he's not quite the bruiser he is, obviously, but he's got a different skill set. So it'd be nice to get him the ball in space, see what he could do. I think we're going to add a good explosive element to our offense for sure. He continued on, said again, I like his speed. That's his calling card. He's 446 at 220 pounds. I liked his speed a lot. He had some good runs at OTA where you saw his burst. He's got good vision, so I'm really excited about seeing him out of the backfield. And then the, the GM, uh, Gutekunst, was saying he's got serious speed. Man, I want to make you say that GM's name about five times. He's very elusive. He's got great balance, so he's a little bit different. This is my favorite part. He's very elusive. He's got great balance, so he's a little bit different than some of the other backs we have on the depth chart right now. Who could that be? <laughs> I mean, that just he, both was... coaches are like or the GM and, and the offensive coordinator are like, yeah, man, he's got speed, and that's different than our running backs. When I heard you talking about Marshawn Lloyd relative to Josh Jacobs, I had one instant thought to something that happened last summer, and it was because I see the situations as potentially parallel, and that does not because they can go both directions. Mm -hmm. I hear the talk about Marshawn Lloyd the way that we were talking about Tank Bigsby, certainly in in uh, and um, Travis Etienne, yeah. And so then I said to myself, I go, well, yeah, but where was where was Tank Bigsby drafted? I would love to – same pick. Same exact same pick. Same exact 80, pick in the draft. Yep. So that's the – the fear overall. is that the the obvious starter that got the money, um, you know, we, we have the excitement and the, and the hope for Marshawn Lloyd. I think a lot of it comes down to the starter. Now, the, the one thing that is different here, though, is that ETN was used as a bell cow. And no running back, not even Aaron Jones, who's been great, is used as a bell cow for Green Bay. That's just not. Yeah, a, I, yes. I mean, they, the, you know, the, the head coach comes out and says that all the time. His philosophy is that he doesn't want to overuse any back. So Marshawn Lloyd will get on the field. Um, and I, I think that this is a really smart offensive system. We saw Jordan Love take that step forward. 
it, it really that's why I let off with the Josh Jacobs stuff uh, because if Josh Jacobs has not lost anything if you know he fat thored last year and then comes back and is full thor yeah I mean th he is the he is the dude he's going to be a great draft pick for fantasy and Marshawn Lloyd will hopefully be what AJ Dillon was a couple of years ago as a backup you but, don't want fat thor no you no. don't want half thor well I you want full thor I want fat thor I want Fat Thor back. Because you want oh, Lloyd. Use your yeah, because I want Marsha Marshawn Lloyd to do well. Marshawn. I, Marshawn. I, the, I like – look, I think Marshawn Lloyd's going to get touches. The It's last year's evidence of A.J. Dillon continually playing uh, despite having other running backs on the team, and they would keep going to A.J. Dillon. But I do have one more unfortunate piece of news for you, Jeff. Oh, uh, no. So Marshawn Lloyd, pick 88. Tank Bigsby, pick 88. There's another running back that was pick 88. Yeah, he's actually one of your dynasty selections. <laughs> Trey Sermon was also picked. Yeah. Is, this, is this the cursed is pick? The, is it literally – like all the picks right around that spot are great, but the, the if fate. you're on 88, I don't know, man. That is that is really bad news, we, and that's great analysis. We need to make a note that if Marshawn here's, Lloyd is a failure, then we're I'm, I'm out on pick 88. Here's the truth about these opportunities for any of these young running backs that aren't day, day one you know, picks. You better make the most of your beginning. That's what under that's what took Tank Bigsby and cast him into the abyss. He made the most for the other team out of yeah, his opportunity. Yeah, he fumbled on the goal line and he threw the ball into their hands. Like if you don't capitalize early, your opportunity's over. They do have other backs that can come in and if the goal is just to spell Josh Jacobs, they can do that with somebody else. He's got to be uh, an early impact player on his touches and if he does that, the rotation changes. So it, it's definitely an interesting name. Ton of talent. Um, interesting offseason for Green Bay and what they did at the running back position because, you know, they just rebuilt it. I mean, that's a high draft capital pick. They had and a, a lot of money that no one saw going to Josh Jacobs from Green Bay. They had A.J. Dillon on the field a lot, and they aren't dumb. You know what I mean? They, they saw it, and they're like, guys, we should do something about this. But you want pieces of this offense. Like this is a this is an ascending offense. If you get the right piece, then you're gonna be very happy. Speaking of that, I gave you that. Dontavian Wicks is the sleeper I want to talk about. Look, we've we've put off talking about Dontavian Wicks as long as we possibly could. Uh but now it just it has to happen because the rumblings are are too strong for what could be. This is Again, this is a sleeper pick. He is being drafted in the 70s over on sleeper. Wide receiver 60 currently on underdog. He was a fifth-round pick out of Virginia, so we are already like, well, I mean, at least for the later picks, the, the fifth-round guys seem to be the ones that find their way onto the field. But his his story is, you know, a gigantic year as a junior. Uh, th there was – you know, some of the, un the unfortunate tragedy over at Virginia, and then things just fell apart for him for his senior year. But he was drafted in the fifth uh, round, partly because he showed out at the Senior Bowl. If you're new to the, the off season, and uh, the, the Senior Bowl is a huge event for seniors who are graduating. <laughs> uh, but it, But it's like it really highlights these guys and the consistency of which when a player balls out, at the Senior Bowl, we see it translate into players who just turn into really good NFL players. You know, you have – so when Wicks was there, it was also Puka, Jane Reed, Tank Dell, Rasheed Rice. These are guys who earn themselves money because of their performance on the field, but then also getting to highlight those things at the Senior Bowl. And last year what he did, seemingly out of nowhere, was actually very impressive. So from weeks 11 through 18, again, fifth-round pick, it's going to take him some time to get on the field, plus some injuries. But in that time span, his metrics, like his behind-the-scenes metrics are very, very good on only 101 routes in that time compared to like Romeo Dobbs, 193 routes. But in 101 routes, he saw 23 targets, where Romeo Dobbs only saw 30 on 193 routes. And he put up – and Wicks put up 280 yards with those targets, 16 receptions. His targets per route run, his yards per route run are at a point where it's you really have to pay attention to this guy because if he gets on the field, really good things could happen. 
Like Jaden Reed, yeah, Jaden Reed is the presumed number one wide receiver for this team. Like that's what he is in ADP. But the numbers should Dontavian Weeks, uh, Dontavian Wicks get on, which he has a couple paths to me. I Don, need it, that. That's what I was going to ask you for. Is I actually want the story. Yes, I need you to tell me the tale of the Dontavian Wicks season because I wanted to put I wanted to put Romeo Dobbs in here too. Like, right. Great, great off season for Romeo Dobbs by all accounts. Head coach coming out and talking about it. But I want you to just tell me, see the future for a minute. Put on the time machine. Put it on. You put them on now. Yeah. yeah so you climb in the time machine. And then come back and tell I me have the story. Been crushed of, by the time machine. Tell me the story. <laughs> tell me the story of the season after you wear the time so, machine. So I, I think that he has a couple pass. So he's not. Jaden Reed is a. What, is, what was that? <laughs> Sorry, that's my fault. That was a miss hit. I was trying to find a different drop. <laughs> wow. I, I yeah, what the, other drop were you going to interrupt Mike with? Oh. I was going for that and just miss hit. My bad. Wow. Heard the drop going the. Oh! He, you heard Al yes. saying, oh? Yes. I heard Man, Hopefully he comes through the microphone. Where's Josh when you but, need him? But <laughs> he's gone. But Jaden Reed, Jaden Reed's spot is safe. But it's like Christian Watson, who's been trying to fix this hamstring, and Romeo Dobbs. Like To me, those are two paths for Wicks to get on the field. Also, just the that they go with some five, uh, four Wait, wide receivers. Wait, what were the set. paths that Watson's take, hurt or that take, Dobbs isn't good enough? Yeah, or just or just takes Christian Watson's job. Like the team gets tired of it. Like we're not going to count on you anymore. You're not a reliable player. Your availability availability is an ability, and Watson just can't stay on the field. So I think that that's a path. Romeo Dobbs, maybe he's capped out. Yeah, he had a, a good season, and I think that he is actually a very fine sleeper as well. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight Wicks that maybe he beats out Romeo Dobbs and just takes his job. The team seems extremely bullish mm -hmm. on Dontavian Wicks. You can easily find sound clips, I mean, including the Matt LaFleur comparing him to Devontae Adams, like saying, I I see you know, shades of him in short area quickness. I think the sky's the limit for him, quite frankly. And yes, coach speak, but like the, the team seems to really like him. And the fact that when he coach got speak. on the field, <laughs> that's not, no, that's not bad. That's not bad. I, I, know, I, know, I know what, what you're saying. You're saying. Mm -hmm. I don't mind that. Okay. But, <laughs> but when he got, really on, the, when he got on the field, just his numbers were were so good. Of He became a go-to player automatically for Jordan Love. So that's that's to me is the thing. He has to get on the field, which is why he's a sleeper and not really being drafted very high or drafted at all. But if he gets on the field, I think that magical things will happen. Yeah, I I really love this sleeper. It's it costs you nothing. He's undrafted. You try to get a piece of this offense, and his actual per route metrics are outstanding. He's a really good wide receiver. And and if you watched the quote, don't just read it, but watch Lafleur talk about him. He's very level minded. You know, he's he knows he's not trying to compare him to Devonte Adams, but he's talking about the specific things that remind you about him and that, that that it's a genuine, like it genuinely reminds him of him because of the way he does certain things at the line of scrimmage and more importantly, off the field, his work ethic and that type of stuff. So this is a guy that the coach loves. And if he gets on the field, he's going to, he's going to be good for fantasy. Yeah. I, I think that that whole offense, the hardest part for everybody the, uh, during the summer right now is just kind of understanding what dominance might look like from specific players in the offense. Mm -hmm. I think we can all pretty easily understand how the offense can function and be successful in general with a bunch of people touching the football. It's just a matter of now, you know, you got a rebuilt running back room. Um, you're going to get back Musgrave. You've got contributions from Kraft. And now you've got four or five names in the in the wide receiver room that are like, are you a superstar, Jaden Reed? Maybe. Are you a superstar, Dante Ian Wakes? You could be. Yeah. And Christian then, Watson, did you fix your running imbalance? Because you were a superstar for a minute. And then, you know, I, I think we all agree Dobbs is probably not a superstar, but he's, yeah. a, he's a solid, maybe a two. He's a, he's a fine two. But Bo I, Melton. Oh, yeah. the Butterman. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm all about Bo Melton. Why do I success. never remember why he calls him the Butterman? Because he's Melton. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. no, it it's means, not complicated. No, it's it's low hanging fruit. That was from that was from a podcast. That was no, a lot of fun. Also, Bo Melton is the butterman because he's melting. Also, Jeremy. Oh, I, this show's good. I got you covered. 
against man coverage, Wicks was the best in football at creating separation open on. Oh, that's why he hit it. I was just a touch early. Yeah. You found a 55 step yeah. for him. All right. Well, that is going to do it for today's episode of the podcast. Uh, what are we doing on Thursday? Are we doing some values and busts on Thursday? That's my guess. I don't have it written down. <laughs> so yeah, they tell me. Um, but yeah, very interesting names. The season quickly approaching. The draft analyzer coming out on July 1st. So you can go to ultimatedraftkit.com for that. And look, if you are bored, you're just sitting around. You're saying, hey, this show is running up, running out of time. I've got nothing to do. Why not go over and leave us a delicious five-star review uh, on Apple or sure. Spotify? It It's just a click, a little tap, tap a -roo. Only one good reason not to do that is if you've already done it. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. That'll do it. YouTube.com slash The Fantasy Footballer. Subscribe. Click the bell over there if you want to watch the show. And like I said, we'll be back on Thursday. Looking forward to it. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.